And what we're hoping to do over the next two hours or so is introduce you to a concept called respiratory compromise and the Respiratory Compromise Institute, which was formed over two years ago, as a mechanism to try to move this whole concept forward. If you haven't seen the article that was published in Respiratory Care a little over a year ago, I really would bring this to your attention. Um, many of the authors of this paper will be speaking today. But what we, we did in this paper is really presented a new paradigm, that respiratory compromise occurs in vulnerable hospitalized patients and that we're probably not doing a good enough job recognizing and intervening early in patients with respiratory compromise. So this is the definition that we set forth in the paper. Uh, it's respiratory compromise is a state where an individual has a high risk for respiratory failure or death but for whom such devastating complications are potentially avoidable. And I think those of us that practice in hospitals recognize this all too frequently. We feel that it's important to identify patients with respiratory compromise and those whom respiratory compromise is worsening in the hospital so that appropriate interventions can be instituted to avoid catastrophic events. So just as way of background, um, it's hard to come up with great demographic uh, or epidemiologic data. Uh, one paper uh, suggested, and, and this is from um, uh, the American Heart Association uh, resuscitation, um, and it's that respiratory failure required emergency mechanical ventilation in at least 44,000 patients in the United States. I think this is a gross underestimate. Um, the um, uh, and uh, National Quality Institute found that over 1% of all surgical patients require an unplanned post-operative intubation. And the development of in-hospital respiratory failure is associated with a mortality of at least 40%. The way I look at it is very similar to looking back at sepsis. Um, those of you that have been around for a while, if you think about where sepsis was 20 years ago, so if you think back around uh, uh, the turn of the millennium, um, individuals got together and, and the surviving sepsis campaign was formed in 2002. And if you look at the goals of the surviving sepsis campaign, they are very similar to what our goals are with respiratory compromise. The plan was to reduce the mortality for sepsis by 25% by building awareness of sepsis. We're hoping to do that with respiratory compromise, improving the diagnosis, increasing the use of appropriate treatment, educating healthcare professionals, improving post ICU care, developing guidelines of care, and implementing a performance improvement program. So even though the surviving sepsis campaign has not been perfect, it's had some bumps in the road over the last uh, 16 years or so, but I think that we can use it as a roadmap to how we can improve the care of patients in the hospitals uh, across the United States with uh, respiratory compromise. So here's where we're gonna be going today. The first thing we're gonna talk about is the history of the uh, Respiratory Compromise Institute, and uh, uh, doing that will be the executive director of the Respiratory Compromise Institute, Phil Port. Next, we're going to be talking about some data that we have presented uh, in abstract form uh, in uh, Medicare data mining. Myself and Sidney Brayman uh, will go over some of that data. I think there's some, some very interesting findings that will, I think, ring true and tell us some uh, places to go in the future. And then finally, uh, we're lucky to have Jeff Vender, uh, kind of the surgical expert in this area, and then Neil McIntyre, the medical expert, to talk about what the future research considerations will be uh, for the Respiratory Compromise Institute going forward.